McLaren 675 LT for when you have a Corvette mindset, but you've financially outgrown Corvettes entirely. McLaren 675 LT, sponsored by Crypto Bros, desperately trying to act like old money. Find someone who loves you as much as McLarens love being bought on salvage titles. McLaren 675 LT! Who even drives Ferraris? What kind of a pretentious pile of old money toenail clippings drives Ferraris? You'll never catch me dead in a Ferrari. I made my money the way God intended, taking a 55% cut of revenue on every model in my agency. McLaren 675 LT! The only British export more popular with YouTubers than Gordon Ramsay. McLaren 675 LT! It looks like something you purchase with V-Bucks. And it's glorious! Sometimes we review rare cars, but there aren't many times where I can say I've driven a car that had fewer than a thousand examples. Even fewer than that if you consider all the work that was done to this particular McLaren that makes it unique and distinctive. Yes, there are things I don't like about this car, and trust me, we're getting three fingers deep on all of them. But this is a car that exceeded every one of my expectations by living up to its reputation as a car I have no business driving whatsoever. Because let's be real, I don't want to be the kind of automotive YouTuber who drives expensive things all the time. Or even most of the time. Hardly some of the time. Because the experience of driving something like this is so alien to me that I almost can't comprehend doing it any more often than once every election cycle. I am an exceedingly simple man, which is going to become a constant refrain that you hear on all of my reviews, because I don't know how to exist around these cars in a state other than the contrasting emotions of envy and aversion. Because I want it. I want it. But I also know that having it would be a terrible idea for a guy like me, who doesn't have the knowledge or resources to maintain a car like this. Hell, Freddy has both of those things, and this was still a gargantuan undertaking for him. He recently released a compilation of his two-year build that totals over seven hours of content, and it really is staggering to see just how far this came from salvage to restoration to blown engine to swap darling. Is swap darling even a term, or is it just something I coined just now that can mean, unfortunately, other things? It's intimidating, even as it beckons you to come have a good time. It's like getting invited to a party by the popular kids. You want to go, but you're wondering if there's some sort of catch that ends with your humiliation, and a nickname that sticks from 10th grade all the way to the 25-year reunion. But hey, once you're face-to-face -face with the 675 LT, it's virtually impossible to resist. I don't know what kind of willpower it takes to just only have one potato chip, nor do I know the willpower of owning a McLaren 675 LT and not driving it every single day. This is a car for the kid who grows up playing in the empty washing machine box and pretends they're a race car driver. And then that kid grows up and buys a car like this and then parks it in their tax shelter auto museum and pretends they're a race car driver. Yeah, I have no loving idea why we have so many of those types of people in Pennsylvania opening up auto museums in the boonies that are never open, or they're open for two hours on a Saturday or something. But it's more or less becoming the norm for when, where, and how you see nice cars in my area. And even then, you're not driving those cars yourself because the owners of those places aren't about to let you. They're not like Freddy who will hand you the keys and let you realize a dream you didn't even know you'd suppressed for being too unrealistic. But what happens when you actually get to drive a McLaren? What is this experience like? Well, I'm the Roman, this is Race to the Bottom, and today we'll be driving to Varish's $275,000 2016 McLaren 675 LT. But first, a quick word from Mr. Regular. The giveaway for this delightfully clean 1994 Mark VI Rover. Thank you for correcting me. It's a Rover Mini Cooper, not a Morris Mini Cooper. The giveaway for this, the giveaway for this 1994 Mark VI Mini Cooper ends this Wednesday. Click on the link in the description or go to go.getentertowin.com slash regular cars. 
you buy a mug or a digital download, and then someone's going to take this thing from me. And then I'm going to have to go out and buy one for myself because I love this thing. I, it's as if this car has been waiting its whole life for me. But now it's time to go back to Nick's video where he talks about an inferior British car and not this superior Mini. Anyway, good luck with the giveaway. It ends this Wednesday. Got a track blaring for the Mac. Claire and bigger shock than on the talk the day they sacked. Sharing six seven to the five and now we're back. Tearing up the track. Karen's hear the brap. Staring like they're gonna call the cops and now I'm off. Tearing down the freeway like a child who's been caught. Swearing is this perfect? Probably not, but then I stopped. Caring about the ones who ate the thoughts I'll never stop. Sharing. The McLaren 675 LT is a good gauge of what people think a nice car is. Because while it's obvious to people who are into cars that this is a McLaren, the average person might see this and immediately think something like a Lamborghini or a Ferrari or even a Corvette. Who really knows? It's not their fault. They have no frame of reference for encountering a McLaren out in the wild. But when they do, it'll give you a window into which cars are generally perceived as being the best among non-enthusiasts. Because whatever they think a nice car is, that is what they're going to mistake this for. In my time with the car, I had someone shout in a very non-facetious way, Hey, that's a really cool Lamborghini! And then I drove to the turnaround point for this shoot and saw someone waiting just to the side of a trail opening. I'm not the best lip reader, but I could have sworn the guy asked his friend, Is that a Ferrari? I mean, honestly, they might have been talking about something else entirely. I need to stop assuming I can read lips. Uh, but, but just go with it for the point I'm trying to make. Because McLarens feel like they exist so far outside the concept of the possible that to see one in public requires some logical explanation that isn't forthcoming. Oh, is he rich? Is he famous? I I is he somebody? He's gotta be somebody if he's driving that. I've seen that sort of speculation for tons of cars. Hell, just this Christmas, I went to the King of Prussia Mall with my niece and nephew, and my nephew saw an optioned-out Cadillac Escalade pull up to the valet lot just as the mall was closing, and he was convinced it had to be somebody famous because famous people love to drive Escalades, I guess. But when the door opened, it was absolutely nobody. So we turned around to leave and immediately walked right past multi-platinum recording artist and Philadelphia native Lil Uzi Vert, who then got in the Escalade with his crew. Now, of course, it's all anecdotal. You're a thousand times more likely to catch an Escalade in the wild than a McLaren. But it all goes to the same notion that certain cars carry the credential that the person they're transporting has to be somebody of consequence, right? But what I'm posing is that the opposite is true for the McLaren. That more often than not, the person behind the wheel of a McLaren is mostly just a guy who likes driving. That's it. Not someone desperate to be noticed. Not somebody who actually wanted a Lambo but couldn't afford it. No, just somebody who wanted a McLaren and specifically arranged their life to make that possible. Because really, if you cared about status and being seen in something expensive, there are more superficial cars you could buy than this, you know? Something that looks fancy but isn't going to require you to break out your tools, to call around the country to find specialists to help you keep this alive. Something that's not going to set you back tens of thousands of dollars after you've already bought it. Because that's more or less what this McLaren did for Tavarish. But Freddy, and I, I know, I know, I'm probably going to keep switching back and forth between calling him Freddy and calling him Tavarish. Just hang with me. But Freddy is still coming out ahead on this thing. Because while this may have cost him nearly $275,000, with the initial purchase and the rebuild accounting for about $241,000, and then an extra thirty-four dollars for the new engine once the factory one exploded, because of course it did, it's still technically a deal when you consider these went for close to four hundred dollars large when they were new. Even used, these go for nearly $280,000 on the high end, so it still makes more sense to take a salvage and break out the defibrillator. And yes, he did get this on salvage, because the heart wants what it wants, and I respect that. I, mean, <laughs> I admire it. It's the automotive equivalent of being a physical therapist, seeing a football player who's told he'll never kick a pigskin again, and thinking, 
Oh, no, we're fixing this. From factory, the engine is a 3.8 liter twin turbocharged V8 making 666 horsepower and 516 pound-feet of torque. But Freddy swapped it for a 4 liter that gets this to about 800 horsepower and 600 pound-feet of torque. And I know, if you're that close to a thousand ponies, why not just do the full millennium? And the answer, and I mean this from the bottom of my boring basic soul, you don't need it. All right? Yet you, oh, you do not need it. This has more than enough. I mean, even if we're not talking about the engine, this, this has the kind of weight reduction not seen since that diner waitress you like dumped her deadbeat husband. From factory, this was the lightest in its class and the lightest of the Super Series line, thanks to all the carbon fiber elements cutting out around 200 pounds. Now, I'm not positive how much of the factory weight reduction remained intact on Freddy's build, but I do know that many of the carbon fiber elements were recreated to be faithful to the OEM model. Case in point, the carbon fiber roof with functional hood scoop that diverts air into the intake air boxes and down into the turbo. After so many years of fake hood scoops and vents, I wasn't actually anticipating any sort of difference in how it would make the car feel. But man alive, this car rips like you're riding a horse made out of angry thunderbolts. It's exceptional and terrifying to go from a dead stop to a potential court date in a matter of seconds. But even while it has the instantaneous pull of a magician ripping off a tablecloth without disturbing any of the dishes on top of it, the McLaren never feels loose or squirrely, because it's not going fast for the sake of going fast. There's considerable care that went into how this thing handles irrespective of what sort of drive mode you're in. I never once felt like I was at the mercy of technology in order to have the most agency I could get out of a car that wasn't a manual. I, I never once felt like I wasn't in control. I never felt like I had to be in sport mode, although yes, I was in sport mode the majority of the time, because why wouldn't you be, really? But that all comes down to personal preference, ultimately. It's like the suspension stiffens and everything becomes more firm and you're cupped in these reassuring pairs of hands that assure you that you're good, we've got you, you're fine, have a blast within the bounds of the law. Do whatever you need to do to feel whole <laughs> again on the inside. And look, I can't speak to how different this is from factory in terms of road feel, but... I do know that Freddy brought in some of the best car guys on the planet to get this thing resurrected in a way that would keep it as OEM equivalent as possible. With the aforementioned carbon fiber roof, with functional hood scoop, replacing the long tail, the gearbox, the front subframe, the rear that was repurposed from a 650S. All these different things that went into making this the best possible version of this car that it could be while still remaining true to what it was in stock form. I've driven rebuilds and resto mods before, but I don't recall ever getting behind the wheel of something that required this much work or this much time. I mean, not even the Vagabond Falcon took this long. Not, the, not even the Crazy Taxi build took this long. This required so much work, I almost expected to have to grade it on a curve. But trust me, it was a relief to realize that I wasn't going to have to make a video dumping on my friend's car a, a literal week after his birthday. <laughs> and I'd have done it. If, if this car deserved it, I would have done it. But this, this is a rare car that's intimidating in a way that encourages you to get the hell over it and come get these revs in. McLaren 675 LT. Don't run from the final boss. Become the final boss. With that said, all right, with that said, I was surprised to find I didn't fall in love with it. And I think it comes down to this interior. Not the appearance, mind you. That That's totally cool. I mean, but it's, it's the feel. And I'm not expecting any car to feel like a stay at the Ritz, but there's an overwhelming stiffness to the seats themselves, the bolsters, the wheel. I mean, I'm a short guy. Not a skinny guy, but a short guy. And it still felt oddly cramped, to where I don't know how people over six feet actually manage to drive this thing with any sort of comfort. It doesn't feel tall guy friendly because it doesn't exactly feel short guy friendly either. 
I mean, the visibility in the rear isn't great, but I don't know that I was expecting it to be. And the front visibility is more or less what you would expect from a car of this caliber. It has that cockpit feel, which is really cool. But I don't know that I would recommend this if you're in any way claustrophobic. I'll just say that. But the interior isn't all bad. With a car like this, you'd almost expect something over-engineered and filled with tech distractions. But it's not like that at all. The custom interior is actually kind of spartan. It's bespoke, with white face gauges, gold accents, and LT embroidering that calls to mind the old F1 badging. It's a very stylish, dignified look, in my opinion, and this molasses, leather-looking interior goes well with the custom Tempest Blue paint, which pops in a way the factory Delta Red just doesn't. But again, even while appearances are cool, they aren't everything, even on a car this nice. The center screen is this lousy tablet that calls to mind that device at Olive Garden that's there just to distract the kids until the food comes. It's early 2010s Garmin quality. It's like Dodge after 2009, there's no RAM here whatsoever. And it lags like an internet connection right when you're getting close. And the stereo system is garbage by Freddy's own admission. I think I forgot to get footage of the glove box, but that also felt intentionally obtuse. You gotta yank on it, but you really don't want to because you're terrified you're gonna break it. But the alternative is losing stuff between the seats because stuff just disappears. Pens, lens caps, house keys I didn't leave at the hotel for some reason. It's not idiot-proof in the way I would probably need it to be. <laughs> Of course, that feels like a really cheap thing to ding it for, especially on the rare car that's actually kind of rare. Not counting the convertible or special editions, there were really only about 500 of these specific models made. Or more like a thousand. Let's just say a thousand. So maybe not the rarest, but it's still got a cool pink center. McLaren 675LT, the official car of guys who eat tomahawk steaks. No, 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 the official car of guys who use tomahawk steaks as weapons because they have some grudges what need settling, but they want it to be a misdemeanor and not a felony. Frickin' tomahawk steaks. How many sticks of butter died to get you moist? I can't even imagine what the hell you pair that with. Are potatoes even worthy? Can I get a nice garlic mash? Or are you gonna, are you gonna sit there on your throne of flaccid apologies and tell me the best you can do is rice pilaf? Tomahawk steaks. The official steak of weaponized eats off Route 183. This is the first McLaren in nearly two decades to get the LT designation for long tail, in tribute to the F1 GTR long tail. And it makes sense since this is a car with blood cells fattened with racing heritage. I mean, for crying out loud, it's basically a 650S filtered through the GT3 racing program. It's as close as you can get to a P1 without paying P1 prices. But that's the catch with a car like this. It's a prestige car, and that means you have to customize the pretentiousness out of it. You have to leave your own mark on it. Preferably nothing that would require you to put it up for salvage auction, but more personal touches that separate this from the look-but-don't-touch gallery of cars that stay under a car cover year-round except for four months out of the year. Cars that take two decades to hit 8,000 miles because they never get driven except to car shows where they go and sit around before going back home to sit again. Yes, in some ways, this is a car designed to reject daily driving, because it's not designed for comfort. It's not designed for driving for long stretches of time. It's designed for short bursts of gratification, like screen time for an eight-year-old. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't drive this car every chance you get if you can manage it. Life is short. I don't think people realize how quickly the years can pile up like old garbage you'd been meaning to take out but never got around to. And now the entire house smells like paths untaken and experiences unlived. So this past autumn, when Tavares said we could come to his shop and drive whatever we wanted, I was ecstatic because I don't feel things like I used to anymore. I really... <laughs> 
One of my biggest points of pride as a person was being able to feel joy at the smallest things, whether it was the idea of going to bed after a long day, like just the thought of landing in my bed, or the possibility of an iced coffee in the budget, or going grocery shopping, even going for a walk, my own solitude. Maybe it's the seasons, maybe it's the loneliness, maybe it's something else, but for a while, I I, I didn't feel how I used to. Getting up was hard. Wanting to was even harder. I had friends say, I'm worried about you, Nick. And normally, my response would have been gratitude that they cared so much, you know, just to feel loved and then feel strengthened by that love. But all I could think in those moments was, okay, what am I supposed to do with your worry? I feel like hell is selfishness you don't care about fixing because your lying mind has told you it's all hopeless anyway. I have no idea what caused all those feelings or why. It all feels like a weird kind of fog, almost like a fever dream that I don't even recall happening other than that there was a period in time where I didn't feel like myself and didn't know how to quantify that, really. But thankfully, I'm doing better now. But here's the point. I think... In some significant way, getting to drive the McLaren got the ball rolling on bringing me out of it. To be handed the keys to a 2016 McLaren 675 LT by a man who's been a supportive ear when I was going through some things, a man I respect immensely, a man I consider a friend, and then to have this experience, I... I don't know why I pretended that this could be an objective review. No, I don't love this car. But I love what it did for me. I may not have a lot of experience with high-end cars, but I have a lot of experience with being Nick Roman. And I know myself well enough to know that driving a car capable of exceeding 200 miles an hour isn't typically my cup of tea. And yet sometimes a different cup of tea is exactly what we need. We need change. We need difference. We need to know life still has the capacity to surprise us. We need that reminder that we haven't seen or experienced all we're going to see or experience yet. Life has still got something for us if we're willing to seek it out. I admit, I'm not always in the right headspace to seek something out. Maybe that's old trauma talking. I don't know. But even if a McLaren isn't something I would consider my cup of tea, I'm still really happy I was given the chance to brew the pot. Don't drive fast For the sake of speed Just feel the handling in the gaps And then let me know If your pants need cleaning Hit that track The cash you spent on this You're never getting back But you'll feel it though A drive that's worth repeating A drive that's worth repeating